first thing that every business needs to have is it has to have the awareness. Where? Right? So for example, when I say your business name, do people know about you? Are, are people aware of that company? Because if you're invisible, it's like you've got a voice like Mariah Carey, but no one's ever heard you sing before. Yeah. Right? So you've got to have that awareness. Are people aware that you even exist? One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the ninety-nine percent and become a one percenter. Hey guys, welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. I'm very excited. I know I always say that, but I'm actually very excited. I got my man John Lee in the house. He's somebody who I've been following very closely on IG. I've been actually stalking his Instagram because we have a lot in common. You know, uh, he became, you know, 20, you know at, at the age of 27, he became a millionaire. So did I, you know, and now, you know, he's creating wealth for others. Matter of fact, he just went public with his company not too long ago, right? And, yeah. and you know, he's the author of The Wealth the Dragon Way, which I picked up and I cannot wait to dig into this. And he's also somebody who loves cars like I do. So welcome, John Lee. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for having me. Brother, I know it's like, you know, um, I don't know what time it is in the UK. I appreciate you being on the show. First, tell us a little bit about your story, how you got into where you are right now. What was the journey? You know, I know you wanted to always become a millionaire. And how was that journey until you became a millionaire? So I started, I mean, my, my parents were originally from um, Hong Kong. So I'm actually living, residing here in the UK. So I was born in England. And so um, when Chinese people go from Hong Kong to England in the olden days, we could, they come here to start their own business, which is a Chinese takeaway. So, uh, yeah. So I, I, I was kind of not forced, but it's, it's tradition that the kids work in the Chinese takeaway. And, and, and for me, I was a dishwasher. So I was washing dishes, um, cleaning the walks, chopping the mushrooms, peeling the onions. And, 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 and for me, I just remember every weekend having to work in my mom's Chinese takeaway. And I, I literally had no choice. Um, and when all my friends were you know, going out you know, with the girls and having parties, and I, you know, I didn't really have a, a you know, my, my teenage years, my, my kid years, um, was just working in Chinese takeaway. And I thought, you know what? And this whole thing of freedom, like for me, that's one of my highest values, having that freedom to do what I want when I want. Um, started at that age. I remember looking in the mirror and just thinking, I'm, I, I got to find, there's got to be a better way than, than just coming here every day to just wash dishes. And, and so then we embarked you know, upon um, education. So my mom said, go to school, get a job, work for somebody else. And, and so I did. And I became an animator. So I worked for, uh, my first company was a games company called EA Games. So they make all the, all the football games. And then from there, I was inspired by this show called Terminator 2, one of my all time favorite films. Yeah. Um, and Toy Story as well. So that inspired me to kind of get into this animation and computer animation. But I had no way of doing it. I didn't know how to do it. So I, I, you know, my mom said, go study. So I got a degree. I became an animator and I, and I worked for one of the biggest visual effects companies in the world. You know, I'm doing, I mean, if you look at all, like, right, I don't work for them now, but if you, they, they still do movies now, all the big films like Avengers and all the Marvel, all the, all the big blockbuster movies that you see, they've actually worked on it. So, you know, for me, it was, it was a journey of, <sighs> Learning the hard way, again, going from working in China as a dishwasher, you know, every weekend, every day, when my parents needed me, to then working in a job and something that I enjoy, but soon turned into a chore. Like, I got to get up at six o'clock. I got to go to work in London. And anyone's listened to this in London, they know what London's like. I mean, obviously, probably not, not now with the whole COVID situation, but it's just like packed. There was just so much, like, you just feel claustrophobic. And so for me, I, I Again, I then had this other voice of, okay, I need to get out of this. I need to, I need to, I, I don't want to tell someone to tell me when I can have a holiday. Um, you know, there's one time when I asked my boss, look, can I take this weekend off for my, you know, friend's wedding? He said, no. I'm like, I, I, I didn't want anyone to kind of have that power over me. And eventually one of the companies I worked for in between these two companies, I got fired because I was too good at my job. So my boss got intimidated. And I remember walking out of that building thinking, you know, what? I'm never going to let anyone point the finger and say, you'll fight again. And that's when I started taking, um, you know, my, my destiny, um, if you will, into my own hands. So, you know, you were washing dishes for a long time 
and you're like, you know what, there's got to be a better way. I don't control my time. You know, everybody's going to you know, hanging around, going on dates, having fun. You know, I'm here stuck, you know, you know, washing dishes. So then you got into, you know, animation. You want animation. So you want to get your degree for that. You work for some of the biggest companies. You were doing fairly well, but then you realize, man, I'm still a, you know, a, a slave to the clock. You know what I mean? I'm still safe to the clock. I'm still got to get up and go somewhere, go somewhere I don't want to be. And then at one point, you got so good at your job and what you were doing that you got fired, which happens all the time. You know, you, you know, you know, somebody gets intimidated and then you say, you know, enough is enough. You know, I'm not going to work for anybody else anymore. I got to find my own way. And then what happened? Well, how old were you at that time? I was in my 20s, early 20s. So when I left university and, and actually if you go a little bit back further from that, you know, even in my career, I wanted like to, to find a shortcut to get to that job faster. So when I was in this sort of early 20s, being in animation and working every day and working every week, and you know, when you work in the film industry as well, like the deadlines are really tight. Uh, you have to get something done by a certain date, otherwise the film can't, can't go out. So for me, I remember saying to my, my, my best friend at the time, and, you know, his name was Darren, and he said, you know, John, you complain a lot, like, you always say you, you want to do this, you want to do that, but you, you keep telling me you can want to do it. Like, why don't you do something about it? And I remember on my birthday, I think it was my 23rd or 22nd birthday, he gave me a book. And the book was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yes, love Rich Dad, right. Poor Dad. Right. And, and, and I, I, I read that book, and I'm dyslexic, right? So I read that book cover to cover, and I've never read a book in my life. I just cover to cover. And I thought, oh my God, like, you can actually make money without having to work for it. I mean, when I say not work for that, you got to create something and then it works for you. So, but I never, no one ever taught me that before. In school, they don't teach you, hey, you can build this and it'll make you money and then you just step away and you just keep making you money instead of you having to trade time for money all the time. So that's when I embarked along the journey of, you know, in that book, it said you need to get a mentor, you need a coach, you need to learn, you must always be, your biggest asset is yourself. And so I, I, and he talks about real estate, but he never really told you how to do it. So I went online and I typed in make money in real estate <laughs> and all these seminars came up and like, it's really that simple, right? Like, like, you know, everybody was like, how do I make money in real estate? Well, fuck Google it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> what are you do? Yeah. And then, and, and, and so I found this guy's name in Ranjan Bhattacharya and he was running the seminar and I attended it and you know, it, it was like, but, but you had to pay money to go. I'm like, this is weird. Why do you have to, paying money to, if these people are so rich, why don't they just let me go for free, right? I had the wrong mindset back then. So, so, you know, I didn't have, the, I mean, I had the money, but I didn't have the money. You know what? People always have this secret stash. Yeah. Um, I, I did not have the money, but really I did, but it's just what people choose to spend the money on. So I went to my uncle Chi and I said, uncle Chi, I'm going to attend this seminar and it's going to make me a millionaire. And he always said to me, he said, John, it sounds like a scam. Don't get scammed. I said, no, 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 no. I said, no, you need to listen to me. Like, this guy is a property millionaire. He's going to teach me how to do it. And I just need to pay 350 pounds. And when you explain it like that, it really does sound like a scam, doesn't it? Like it sounds like weird. So I said, look, just, I tell you what, you, let me go there. You give me the money. I'm going to go there. I'm going to, you know, learn this stuff. And when I come back, I'll teach it to you. And you know what? I'll just, look, if you really think it sounds good to be true, I, I'm willing to give you 50% of my first two deals. And then I, and then he gave me the money to go. And I can tell you, when I attended that, I was learning things that, that on the surface sounded, there's no way you can do that. There, there's no way you can buy a house that's worth 200,000 and buy it for 100. There's no way you can get 50,000 off a property like that. And that was just my mindset. Yeah, yeah. That was my mindset. And then, so I started learning about, okay, number one, you have to find deals below the market value. Number two, you have to be able to finance them. Number three, you've got to be able to monetize them. And so I started to learn the basic concepts of property investment. Wow, you know, so, so tell me, so what was your first deal? So you started learning from, you know, you know went to a seminar, you paid 350 pounds, you borrowed from your uncle, you know, yep. you, you know yep. and, and, and then obviously, you know, what was your first deal? Once you went to that seminar, you obviously, you know, they were teaching things that blew your mind because your, your mindset wasn't there. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, when somebody was like, yeah, man, I made a hundred grand, you know, flipping this, I'm like, what? Because when, when, you know, when you think 100 grand, somebody has to work a year or two years to make 100 grand, and this guy do it in a, in a weekend, also your mind is you know, stretched, right? So right after the seminar, 
how long did it take for you to start making some money? What, what did you do? What was so my, my first, I'll, I'll tell you about my first three deals, right? My first three deals. I remember like, like it was yesterday because I was, I was so involved in on your first date. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. You remember like, it's exactly like that. So my first, one of my first deals I bought in Manchester. Um, and how did I get this deal? So I started attending networking events and I don't think I've ever told this on any interview before. It's not even in the book. I always tell people about one of the best deals, but I never tell people about my first three deals. So that's the first ever deal that I got was actually in Manchester, right? And that property, if I remember correctly, the mar- it was on the market for around 125,000, but I was buying it for 92 and a half thousand pounds, right? Because I remember negotiating, wanted 93, and I, I was trying to chip them down a little bit. And I remember, well, I was still working at the time. And I, my, my best friend, Darren, I said, at lunchtime, we, need, we want to go and see this property. So obviously we're, we're working in London with the properties in Manchester. So we, the only way we could see it was through one of those brochure things. So we, we, we took the tube, we went there and we turned up to this dingy looking office. And it was like, it, I mean, it looked like, a, like someone had just opened up shop and, and, and stuck a poster on the front to say, you know, this is it. And I remember signing that contract and walking out of that building and saying to Darren, I think, I said to him, I think I've just been scammed, <laughs> right? That's what I said, I think I've just been scammed. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit dodgy. And the, the people who were operating it, they, they weren't sure when the completion dates were. They, they were very vague with the, with the um, uh, responses. Yeah, yeah, responses. And, and they would never reply. So that, that's why I, I, I suggested we go down. So I signed the contract anyway, and I handed over my deposit, like a, like a small, like, they want a thousand pound deposit. I'm like, something doesn't feel right here. And it dragged on and on and on and on. And probably around, I think it was about oh, coming close to like nine or, nine or 10 months, um, this, deal, this deal still hadn't been completed. And of course, my friend Darren is like, yeah, it's a bit dodgy. Like, like, let's find a way to try and get our money back. So we're calling up and say, hey, look, you know, I want our money back. He said, no, no, look, it's going to complete soon. It's going to complete soon. Things with the property takes a little bit of time. You know, the lawyers, and they kept blaming the lawyers and lawyers. And anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up completing on that deal. And that deal still to today makes me, that one deal makes me around 700 to 800 uh, a month. And that's been doing that for the last 10 years. That can pay for one of your cars, uh, you know, lease payments or, you know, out if you lease and buy, I don't, you know, you know, but that's exactly what people need to understand that you can create passive income to pay for your lifestyle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and uh, so tell me, you know, you know what, you know, you know, that, that was your first deal, but just in general, I know, I know you wrote a whole book about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I want you to teach me and the audience how to make money the dragon way. Okay. So it's any business falls into three cats. Like there's only three things you really got to do in any business. doesn't matter if it's real estate. I mean, I do real estate now. I do technology. I've got an app. I have an events company. I do consulting. So it really doesn't matter what you're going to. The first thing that every business needs to have is it has to have the awareness, awareness, right? So for example, when I say your business name, do people know about you? Are, are people aware of that company? Because if you're invisible, it's like you've got a voice like Mariah Carey, but no one's ever heard you sing before, yeah. right? So you've got to have that awareness. Are people aware that you even exist? That's the first thing. The second so thing how, is- How do you increase awareness? Would it be through marketing, through branding? Oh, there's so many different things. I mean, like, like for me, I tell you, like my, my real estate company. So um, the second deal I did, I did through um, uh, my, my broker, right? So I went to the broker. And so how did I create more awareness? I started just mixing in the circles of where those deals were likely to be. Because I knew brokers, they, they get money for people for houses. But a lot of people get declined a mortgage because of their financial circumstances. So in that case, what do you do with the deal? Well, you hand it to the person that has the affordability so, so they don't lose the deal. And actually that broker ended up being my mentor, which I paid, by the way, 10,000 pounds for two days of his time. 10,000 pounds. Right? Okay. Everyone thought I, I, sold, I sold my car to pay him the money. Everyone thought I was crazy. You paid him $10,000. 10, pounds, pounds, pounds. Whoa, 10,000 pounds for two days. But here's the question I'm going to ask you. That 10,000 pounds created you how much money? Oh my God. Six months after, the, after those two days, I bought 35 houses in six months. Do you know how? 
people think I'm crazy. Like, why are you buying so many houses? How do you buy so many houses? You're like, you have millions. Of, I didn't have millions of dollars back then. He taught me where to finance the deals like all rich people do. Rich people use something called OPM, other people's money. They never use their own money to buy. And he said to me, he taught me one concept. That, that one concept he taught me was worth a £10,000 investment. All my friends around me, oh, you, you're being scammed. You're so ridiculous spending all your money. Like, stop, stop being scammed all the time. And like, why do you keep saying that? It's like, so people never understand. And so that's when I decided to stop telling people what I do because they would always talk me out of it or they always put these negative thoughts in my mind. So now I let all my results do all the talking. Anyway, my point is, um, he taught me a way that if you find that deal, the money will find you. And it's so true. Do you know, um, when he taught me how to find this deal, that the third deal that I got, so the second deal, he actually passed on to me. Because one of his, so he was on for 250,000. I bought it for 200,000. I made 50,000 there, bought it, right? And that one for about six, six years, six, seven years was paying me around 550 a month. And then I, I sold that one because, you know, there was some thing in the clause and the contract that forced me to sell it. But if I had the choice, I would have kept that deal because it was making me money every single month without really doing anything. Third deal that I bought um, was on a place, um, called, if anyone's watching from the UK, it's a place called Aldershot. Um, where it's not a very nice area. I mean, when I say back then, it had a, a stigma, right? Like people didn't want to live there because they thought, oh, it's, a, it's not such a nice area. Like you must, like living, if you're going to live in, sorry, live in Guildford. And so I thought, well, what's wrong? I went to the area. There's nothing wrong with the area. Okay, it's not as posh as other areas, but this is what I learned, right? When you buy a house, don't buy the house for you to live in when you make a decision to do it. Buy it based on the numbers, and so this house on the market, all the other houses on that market was on for about 180 to 190,000. This particular property was offered to me through a networking event that I went to from a lady um, called Julie McDade. She gave this property to me because I networked with her. I had value to her. And she said, John, if I get a deal in your area, I'll give you a call. And sure enough, a few weeks later, I get a phone call from her. I got this deal. This is what the houses are worth. And you're going to buy it for 140. I'm like, whoa but I've just done the due diligence. Like they're about 180. That means I'm getting 40. Is there something wrong? I started looking for all the things wrong with it. What's wrong with it? Is it like, is it a dud deal? Why, if it's so good, why are you not taking it? Right. But here's what I, I learned. People, if they, even people can make a lot of money, they don't want to make money. It's really weird. It's just, it's like my accountant. He knows how much money I make, but he knows exactly how I do it as well. But yet he doesn't do it himself. So this is where I learned about risk profiles. Right. I noticed that, John. I, I noticed, right. I, I, you know, same thing with my accountant. You know, you know, you know, you know, people sometimes, you know, pe you know, people see it. It's right there it's for them to grab, but they're just like, no, they walk away with it. Why do you think that is? Is it because they're, you know, they're comfortable doing what they're doing? Or is it just always that fear like you had? Like you, there was always that fear. Hey, man, if I put 140000 if I know I can make forty to $50,000 on this property, you know, I'm like, what if something can go wrong? What if something's wrong with it? What is something I can't see? You know, do you think it's fear or do you think they're just comfortable or both? Well, here's the thing. It's, it's risk profile, right? Like, are, are, they willing, are they willing to lose everything? Are they willing to, like, if they lost everything, would, would they be happy with it? Back then, I was young, you know. I, I didn't matter if I lost everything. I mean, I wasn't worth much back then anyway, right? But my point is, that deal, I didn't even buy for 140 because in because my mentors and my coaches and all, all the seminars I attended taught me about negotiation, right? So whatever deal you're getting it for, even if it's really good, Ask for a bigger discount. It, you've got nothing to lose. So I ended up buying that deal for 85,000 pounds. What? 85,000. How did it go from one? So it's worth about 180. Yep. So back, you know, they're asking 140. How yep. did you, know something? you go from 140 to 85? Was it distressed? Was it that I couldn't pay the pay? It, no, no. So, so, so here, was, here was the situation. That property specifically, um, it was, for, for, first of all, this person didn't have any mortgage on the property, right? So to them, even... Even 85,000 was good money for them. They still made money because we assume, oh my God, that's such a big, see, one lesson I learned is never assume. Assumption is the mother of all F-ups, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, never yeah. assume anything. So when, when we made that offer, obviously the property did need some work as well. I mean, there was like, it was dilapidated. It needed like, it needed a full refurb. But when you look at it, there was holes in the walls. There was electrics, like water running down the sides. The banisters didn't, didn't have like, you know, the, when you walk up the stairs, they don't have the, the banister things to keep safe. It was actually quite, it wasn't even habitable, really. It wasn't a habitable pro uh, property, but 
again, with the right knowledge, like if I didn't have the knowledge, I would have thought, oh my God, I have to spend a hundred thousand pounds fixing this. I don't have a hundred thousand pounds, but with the right knowledge, I know how much things cost. For example, to paint the house would only cost me 2000 pounds to carpet the entire house, two and a half thousand pounds, a kitchen, no more than a thousand pounds. So I could, I, I quickly went around that, that property. And one thing they taught me was to look up at the ceiling. All right. I said, why? He said, because when you look, if there's lots of shit that's everywhere, you can't tell what, where the space is. If you look up at the ceiling, it will show you the floor plan. That's true. So I looked up and thought, oh my God, I can do that. I can do that. Oh my God. Yeah. I can. So, so that's the strategy I learned was what we call forced appreciation. You can force the appreciation. If you change a property from a two bed to a four bed, it's automatically worth more. The question is, can you squeeze the space out of it? Right. So I knew this is why the education is important because I had enough information to make an informed decision and to even spend £22,000 on that property and it would be a brand new house. And you know, Sam, that, that property I bought for 85000 I spent around £22,000 on that and then I sold that for 195000 Right? Wow. So, so you basically made like $78,000 on it. Yeah, that became my secret. And, and you know what? So Ying Tan um, taught me how to get the money. I didn't, I didn't have 85,000 pounds. I had to go and find it. So I had to join all these like investor circles. I paid th- another three and a half thousand pounds to become part of a networking event where investors were. And that's when I found someone called um, Karen. And then Karen put me in touch with another lady called Shirley Wheeler. Shirley was, she's a millionaire. She had all this money in the bank. And then my mentors taught me how to pitch to investors, right? Getting money from investors is not hard because they just want to know what's in it for them. And they want security. So as long as I can provide what's in it for them in security, they always give you the money. So, so what kind of security did you provide for that building? So I literally asked, so it's funny because when I sat down and um, I had this, 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 I went to Windsor and I sat down and she was a multi-million dollar house and, and you know, we, 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 we sat there and, you know, I, I asked this question. I asked, you know, I've got this property. This is the first time we're doing this. And by the way, we, we, we'd met a few other times. I think the first time was actually in Windsor, but not actually at a house because at a house where we did the money. But next to there was like this, this hotel called, I think it's called the Copthorne Hotel. That, that's where we met the, for, for the very first time. Because you, you've got to have a number of meetings with investors. That, I mean, that, you can't meet them for the first time just them, for them hand you You've got to build that relationship. You've got to build a trust. So in the very first meeting, um, this is why it's so important to have a mentor. Um, and she's very straight talking. Hey, John, I heard that you need some money. How much do you need? Right? I was like, whoa, <laughs> hello, <laughs> how are you? Um, and I, I was walking through the deal. And then she asked me this question. She said, John, can I just ask you, how many of these deals have you done? And in my mind, is like, oh my gosh, shall I lie? Shall I just tell her um, I've done 100 deals? And I said, you know what? Can I just, you, you want a drink? So I, I, I went to get up to the bar and, and I went to get a drink. In that distance, I called my mentor. And I said, Ying, she just asked me this question. Um, like how much, like, do I lie? I said, no, never lie. Be transparent. The only reason she's asking that question is because she wants to know if her money's secure. I said, well, how, what shall I say? And she said, when you get back, ask her this question. So I got the drinks. I sat down and asked this question. So she asked me again. So John, how many of these deals have you done? I said, well, I'll tell you, very, I'll be very frank with you. This is my first deal. And I know why you're asking that. You're asking that because you're, you're maybe worried that, you know, if you give me this money, it's going to be a risk. So let me ask you a question. How, what would have to happen for you to give me the money and to feel secure? And she said, well, it's very simple. I need um, uh, lawyers, I need paperwork, I need security in the property. And I literally said, so if I can get you those three things, are you going to give me the money? She said, yep. I was like, I, I could not believe it. And like a few months later, I had 85,000 pounds in the bank. I, 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 I obviously had to pay her interest as well on top of that. But this is someone who just handed over 85 grand well, with security in the house. So if I didn't pay her back, she could then sell that property and withdraw the money back. So, but I never knew that stuff. This is why education is so important. You've got to have enough information to make an informed decision. And when I talk about risk, you talk about risk before. The one thing that trumps risk is your ability and your confidence to have a calculated risk. So the question you have to ask is how do you de-risk that whole thing? Education, knowing the rules. You go and you play a game with no rules, you're going to get crushed. You play the game knowing the rules inside out, you, you, you're you going to have a, at least a chance of winning. And so this is what I started to understand. As I started to develop myself in business, I started to develop myself in self-development. I can see a lot of books behind you and, and that's why you're successful because you put so much self-development, so much knowledge into your head that you cannot not fail because you already know the outcome that's going to happen or you know what, what challenges you're, you're going to be facing. 
You said something, John, that makes total sense. If you find deals, money is easy. You know what I mean? You know, because, because you know, it makes sense. It, t- it makes total sense. You present somebody that, hey, man, I got this deal. Here's your collateral. Here's why it makes sense. You know, now a lot of people are listening to this podcast right now. They're like, hey, I got some deals, but how do I find investors? You know, how do I, you know, get, you know, get, you know, get in front of some sharks or some, some local investors and all that kind of stuff? What would your advice be? There's only two ways, really. Number one is by luck. Right. And by luck, I mean, you create your own luck on number two, pay to play. Right. So I paid three and a half thousand pounds to join an, an, an investor network. Cause I, cause I thought to myself three and a half thousand pounds, a lot of money. And back then I, you know, I sold, I had a beautiful Honda S2000 convertible, you know, like Honda, as a Honda, you know, S2000? It, 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 oh, I love those, man. Beautiful car, right? Yeah. You know, a little night rider, zzz, 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 right? Yeah. Like and I thought to myself, but, but I sold the car and I got around 15,000 pounds. I paid Ying 10,000 10, pounds. And then I had, and I paid another three and a half thousand pounds, which leaves me with a grand and a half, which then I had to spend on a, a like an old banger, right? So I literally spent all my money, you know, that I sold my car and everyone thought I was crazy. So like, you, 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 but, but I knew, I thought, oh, three and a half thousand pounds, that's money I don't have. But if I can just find one investor, and this, by the way, Shirley ended up financing, you know, like the, the first 12 or 13 deals that I did. Because once you work with an investor and you pay them back, they give you more money. You pay them back, they give you more money, right? So that's what we call a joint venture. So when you start joint venturing with people, you have partners that come in and then you say, okay, you pay for the kitchen, you pay for this, you pay for the legal fees, I'll do all the, all the groundwork. So actually I wasn't even financing anything apart from the valuation of the property. I will let everyone, everyone else do it because when you upskill yourself, your skill is worth more than money. Yes. Yes, man. I love that, man. You know, I love the fact that, you know, as a young kid, all of us, our cars are everything. You know, that, you know especially, you know, if you're a car enthusiast, I know mine was, but the fact that you are willing to give up something that was so valuable, some, you know, your, your, your pride, you know, pride and joy, your Honda S2000, you sold it to get mentorship and to better yourself and that's something that a lot of people need to pay attention because a lot of times we get so caught up into material things. Oh no, I can't do that. I no, no, I need my Honda. No, I need my, de-. you know, nothing is more important than investing in yourself, your education, you know, and also figuring out how to make an asset work for you. It's something that you've done, you know, um, you know, over and over and over. Now, right now you own several companies, you know, yes. you, you know, so, so tell us about your coaching, your mentoring, Tell us about all the companies that you, did, you, you own and operate and what does, do they do? Tell me about how you took your co- um, company public. That, that's something that's very interesting. So um, in 2011, I had the privilege and honor of sharing the stage with Sir Richard Branson, who owns Virgin Airlines. And so I remember him talking and, and just hearing about what's the one thing that makes him a billionaire? Because one thing I learned as I started to learn from people, I thought, oh my God, like, people have knowledge that can make you rich. Right. And you know, interesting enough, people who have the knowledge, if they're not rich themselves, that, that knowledge can still make you rich. So I started to look at what other people are doing, like, okay, what makes this person? And, you know, I remember picking up the, in the UK, we have something called a Sunday Times Rich List, where, you know, on a Sunday, they, they publish a list of all the wealthiest people um, in, in, in the UK. And I just look at, it'll say, you know, X person, which industry, oil and gas, this industry, trader, this, and I start to see all these people who are wealthy, they all have some kind of business, real estate or investing. So I thought to myself, well, if I can do what Richard Branson does, and he's got like, at the time he had like 400 companies and he takes a piece of every pie and he just basically built a brand and people are licensing the brand and he just puts his name to it and he's an amazing marketer. So when I started figuring out, wow, that if I can just, start a business and I can, I can replicate that business so other people can replicate it. So in a way like, because you know, like when hiring people, it's always hit and miss, right? A lot of people will, that work for my company now are my followers. A lot of people that work for my company now are people who I've met in, in my, my other seminars and my events. And so those are your, your best hires. And I thought, oh my God, like does, instead of like paying people a fee to work for you, and, and I do, you know, we, we, we have paid staff. Part of my mindset was, well, why don't I just get people to pay me to train them and then they come work for me, <laughs> right? It makes more sense. Yeah. It makes more sense because like, they're more committed. They'll do whatever it takes. They'll, 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 
you know, go out of their way. It's not like, oh, it's, it's, it's nine and five, I'm going now, bye-bye. It's like, like, they've got the right mindset. So you hire attitude over skill. And so when you do this, people put some skin in the game. When they pay, they pay attention, right? So then I start to figure out, wow, if I can just build teams, so I can just have people that work with me and, and then we partner together, then we can make more money. And this is exactly what happened, um, how, we, how we got into the whole um, event space. This is how I 10 x to my property company. So the first thing I did, I did something called collaboration, right? So I met this guy called Vincent Wong. He wrote that orange book there. He's called um, Property Entrepreneur. Um, and he was a property millionaire. And this guy had the biggest website in the UK for anyone wanting to sell the property. Like you'd open the newspapers, you see his adverts. I thought, wow, you know what? I'm not really good at finding deals and it's hard to find deals. Like what's the shortcut? I just ask him if he can give me some deals, right? So sure enough, where I start networking, I start going to the net, and lo and behold, I meet him, that very person at the, I said, you're not that network property. Yes, I am. I said, oh my God. So we started becoming friends. He invited me for some barbecues, some dinners, and we both have to be Chinese as well. So I don't know. I don't know if it was like a coincidence thing, but we ended up building a good relationship and, you know, we started to do a little bit of business. Like I put some stuff his way. And I remember there was one time someone was slating his company on the internet and I didn't really know his company at that time, but I stuck up for him. And, you know, till this day, uh, we start this partnership. This is how we took the company. He said, bro, do you know why I decided to work? He said, why? He said, do you remember that post you made years ago? And I, I, I love to find that post. He said, and you stuck up for my company. That's why I'm working with you right now. That's so you know? good. Because you, you, you show loyalty and respect. Loyal. It's a lot of people yes. these days. A lot of people these days, they don't. They, oh, I'm not going to get involved. I don't want to get involved. It's not my thing. It's not my thing. You know, right. but, but that, that, that's, I mean, I, I can see why. I, but he did, yeah, but, but Vince, he had like 16,000 property deals like generated from the internet, 16,000. But he, he wasn't buying them for himself. He was trading them a lot. So he'd get them and he'd trade them out. And I said, look, I said to him, why don't you keep some for yourself and build some wealth? He said, what do you mean? He said, I'm making a lot of money. Like he's making thousands and thousands every month. Like for him, it was just cash flow. You know, it's like, you know, making a lot of money, like you don't need to build wealth when you're making cash flow. You know, back then you, that's what you think. I said, why don't you keep, so he start, then he started buying property in London and, and obviously he, he was telling me how much houses he was buying them for and how much they're worth now in central London. It's insane. You know, and, and the deals that he was selling, like he bought for this price, he made, he sold, he made half a million profit, like flipping deals. So then I start, I said, look, and I asked the question, I said, so you got this, this, site that generates these leads and, and you get thousands of them. Um, can I ask you, how can I help you with that? What, what's your biggest challenge right now that I can help you with? And you know what he said to me? Sam, he said, well, my biggest challenge right now is I've got thousands of people that I don't have the time to go back to and follow up on the deal because new ones keep coming in. And I said, I need help with them. I said, okay, well, I'll help you with them. I'll, I'll you know, teach me how to do this. And by that time, I'd already had some training in how to speak to people on the phone. So he started passing me these deals. I'm talking about not just like one a week. I'm talking about 50 or 60 in a week. Wow. Property deals. Wow. Right? So I'm like, so I was caught. So then I started honing my skill, right? I started getting good at negotiating. I started getting good at asking people questions. I, I, and it got to a point where I knew within five minutes of that conversation if I'm buying that house or not. Right? So obviously the deal was he gives me the deals. Every house I buy, I pay him a percentage of, of what I buy. And he was happy because he could take that money and pump it back into marketing to generate more leads. So it became this win-win. And what starts to happen a few years after that, people start asking me questions now. Oh, John, uh, you know, I heard you doing this property thing. And you know, I heard from a friend of a friend of a friend who said you did this. Can, can, you, can you take me out for, for, you know, for coffee? I said, sure. So I'd go out and I'd sit down with people and I'd, I'd, I'd tell them exactly how to do it. And then that person would tell somebody else and they would tell somebody else and come to me and every day I'd be going for coffee. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm, I'm literally like spending all my day with these people. I should be focusing my business, you know? So I, I got to a point where I just said, you know what? Um, just, just ask me a question. I'll write it down. And then, so all these questions that came to me, I start writing down into like this, I guess like a frequently asked questions. Um, which later became like one of the best selling books in the, within our industry. And so I just, every time someone comes to me, I said, you know what? I'm really busy, but look, just read this. And that person would then start passing it around to people. Right. And the more people passed it around, the more phone calls I would get. Hey, John, I heard you do this deal. Can you negotiate my deal for me? Then I get paid for making phone calls now to close the deal. And then I became the deal closer in our industry. And then one guy read it and he said, I got a phone call. His name is Steve Foley. I'll never forget this. 
and I said, hey, John, um, I just read your report. I think it's quite fascinating. Would you mind doing a, a, a presentation on that and doing a talk? I said, no, nah, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm not a speaker. He said, no, I'll just come along, bring your report and, and just explain it to people. I said, okay. And he kept calling and calling. I said, okay, right, fine, I'll, and because it was down the road at the time, I said, chip, fine, I'll go. And this time I moved back to Manchester. So, uh, you know, back to my hometown. Manchester and, and London is about, about three and a half hours, four hours apart. So uh, I just popped down there. Imagine a room, like a really big room with six people there. And it was, it was so like, like you could hear a pin drop. Wow. And I thought, this is really weird. And I thought, okay. And you know, like when they introduce you, please welcome John Lee. And there's like this, like, this really <laughs> awkward <laughs> clap. <laughs> right? um, so I stood down like, okay, well, um, it's just us. So uh, yeah, so Steve told you about this report. And I just thought, I literally started reading. Here's the funny, funny thing that happened. About three weeks later, I get another phone call from a guy called Just Want Right. And he calls me and says, hey, John, I heard you spoke at Steve's event. And, he, and, the, and the, the things we were talking about was really fascinating. Can you come do it at my event? And sure, I'll come along. Thinking it was going to be the same thing. What I didn't know when I showed up to this car, I drove three and a half hours to get there. And it was about, the car park was full. So in my head, I'm thinking, oh, there's a wedding here or something. <laughs> so I walk into reception. I say, hi, my name is John Lee. I'm the guest speaker for tonight's event. Would you mind telling me where it is? So yeah, it's just through that door. I said, what, where the wedding is? No, no, no. That's the event. I'm like, I start, I start going pale. <laughs> I, I say to just one, I say, hey, you never tell me there's all these people. I say, every month, there's 250 people there. I start panicking. I'm like, I, I, I've never spoken in front of like, you know, like six or seven or eight people, let alone 250 people. So this is how he introduces me. He said, we have a very special speaker. He's come all the way, like, like I've flown overseas to go there. And he said, he's the author. I'm like, what? Why are you telling people I'm an author? Because you're not at the bottom of my FAQ. I put authored by John Lee, right? So he thought I was an author. So everyone's getting really excited now. He said, please give a massive round of applause for John Lee. I was like, yeah. I'm walking up there. I'm like, literally like peeing my pants. My heart's going, bum, 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 bum. My mouth's getting really dry and my hand's getting really sweaty. And I just, and I read a book once called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers. Amazing book. And I just, I took that advice, I took a deep breath in, deep breath out, and I just started, I took my report and started reading. And after about 10 minutes, um, I started getting into it, and then people were like, whoa, like, this is good. And after that event, I was like a celebrity. At the end of it, everyone's standing up, giving me a massive round of applause, and people like asking for pictures and coming around and, 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 and talking to me, asking questions, like I was the expert, but I, I really wasn't, you know? And then... I go to turn and, this, and everyone finishes. We're about to finish that. I go to turn. The guy puts his hand on my shoulder and he looks at me and I'm like, oh shit, he's going to say something really bad to me right now. It's oh, John, I forgot to ask you, how much is your report? I'm like, what, what, what report? You know, the one that you were holding, how, like, how much is it? Like, like, where can I buy it from? No one ever asked me that question before. So I said, I, I don't know, um, 47 pounds. The guy takes his wallet out, gives me 50 pounds to keep the change. <laughs> That's when I knew that, oh my God, what's in my head all those years, all those you know, seminars, all those courses, all those mentors that I pay for, it yeah. became second nature to me. And I thought that everybody already knew that stuff. And so what happened? I went home and I told my business partner, I said, you know what, you've got to write a book. He said, what do you mean? Like, you've got to write a book. He said, that's never going to happen. He said, why? He said, well, there's two problems. I'm not a writer and you're dyslexic. I'm like, okay, but let's just try anyway. You know, Sam, you'll never, you'll, you'll never believe this. We, I wrote this guide, right? So we spent six months, we copy and pasted it together. He wrote half, I wrote half, we copy and pasted it together. Um, and then I got all the business cards so six months later. Yeah, it's actually not that, it's not that one. It's actually two versions before that. Oh, so of that's actually in there, right? Okay. Um, and it was the worst book we'd ever written. <laughs> and but we said, you know what, let's just, do it anyway. So I got, do you know you go to networking events, you start getting all those like business cards, right? Everyone gives you business cards, don't they? So I had 800 of these stacked up in my drawer. And I just took them all and start inputting them all into a spreadsheet. And I copied all the email addresses. I got a PayPal link for 47 pounds. I said, hey, we met at an event. You, you, if, you're interested, if you're still interested in property, um, click here to buy my brand new book. Do you know, I woke up in the morning but you know, about, about seven hours sleep. I woke up in the morning, so I'd sold 369 copies in seven hours. I made 17,433 pounds 
whilst I was sleeping. I could not believe it. I could not believe it. And this is what sparked the whole events uh, business because the more events that we run, the more investors we find, the more buyers we find, the more sellers we find. And it was like this ecosystem was beautiful. And we've been replicating that for, for years. And obviously we learned to raise finance. We learned to, um, you know, in a fight, pitch, pitch our ideas. We learned all the basic fundamental business skills that's needed to make a business successful. Marketing, sales, operations, people, and finance. All those five things. Uh, and, and obviously going through that journey, now having listed a company in the stock exchange, you know, we did our first IPO, same process, raising money, pitching, doing road shows and events because I, I became a speaker. I got invited to a lot of speaking engagements all around the world after that. I got good at pitching. I got good at presenting, right? And then obviously my background in film, which I thought was a complete waste. Now I use for social media to edit my videos, put them online. Like it's almost like every piece of the jigsaw puzzle that I've learned in my life is now being for this moment. And I, I tell you, man, I love your social media posts. I love your stories, man. You know, I don't, you know, I don't go on Instagram much, but when I do, I make sure I look at your stories and things like that. I, I laugh, you know, I, I was, I was following you when you were going to the different dealerships trying to figure out which car to buy. I was like, Oh, which one, which one, which car did you end up going with? Lambo. I'm always a Lambo guy. Always. You, know, you, you, you were, you were going to Austin Martin. Yeah. You, you were going to Porsche, right? You were going not to Porsche, a Bentley. Bentley, Bentley. Yep. And you went to the Lambo. You know yep. what I mean? And, and I was like, I, was like well, I wonder which one, so which one did you end up getting and why? The Aventador S. Oh man, yeah, man. I had an Aventador SV. Oh, they are so raw. They are raw. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. You it's know, quite uncomfortable to drive, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the S I heard is so much better. The SV. Yeah, it's got smoother gearbox. Cause I've always liked 27, I had my first Gallardo, which I crashed <laughs> with my <laughs> business partner in it. The second one that I had was a yellow Gallardo Lamborghini, which got stolen. The third one was third time lucky. So I had that for about four or five years. And I went from that to a hurricane. So hurricanes, actually, if anyone's watching this, if you're deciding which Lambo to buy for driving, get the hurricane. Cause it's I, got I was going to tell you that I, I, you know, I, you know, I bought a hurricane. I, I sold my SP and bought a hurricane for Vermonte, And I love every minute of driving that car. The you gearbox know? on that car is amazing. Yeah. It's like, it's just like, you just touch it. You touch it. It's, it's no, there's no being hit in the back. If anyone's had a Lambo before, like when you, it's like when you're accelerating closer, you're getting hit in the back all the time, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. My SV was just too much, man. You know, it looked so good, but the driving, you know, the driving experience wasn't there for me. You know, I, you, and know, you, I get low back, you get a low back pain as well. Yes. Yeah. I remember one time I, I drove the SV to an event and I, 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 it was an hour drive. I came back, I got in my rolls. Like, I felt like I sat on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it was like a night and day, night and day difference, man. Night and day difference. But, I didn't but, 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 but coming back to that, here's the thing, like, you know, from just as an, as, as an aside, a lot of people think like buying Lamborghini is a waste of money. And it absolutely is. I mean, the cars, I mean, you have to know which Lamborghini to buy. The SVs really hold the price. The Gallardos hold the price. The S's limited, it's okay. But the main reason why I went for the Lambos because they run for, like I've had Ferraris and all these other 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 you know supercars or Audis before you know, the the R8s, um, but what I noticed with Lamborghini specifically, they organize more events. Yes. So right, so I get invited to all the Christmas parties. I get invited to all the you know like the the the, the countryside drives. The the I've just been invited to the you know the Alps to do the Italian snow things. Go to the factory, but they run so many events and. That networking, oh my God, it's oh my gold. God, John, you're so right. You're so right. You know, um, you know, I always get those emails. Yeah, but the monthly networking thing, the drive the Lamborghini and all that kind of stuff. And I have kids, you know, so I never really go. You yeah. know, I, I never really go. You know, I'm like, oh, usually it's a Saturday, you know, it's a family day for me. But, you know, my wife and the kids were out of town and it happened on a Saturday, you know, recently that, uh, that I was like, okay, man, I can go. You know, so I actually went. And I'm like, oh my God, if this is not a mastermind, this is not an investor. It is a mastermind. <laughs> not an investor. It's a mastermind. Well, not free, but you know, you buy a car, you get an invite. Yes, for sure. You know, and, and I'm like, oh my God, I met so many people that I could possibly do business with, possibly network with. And to me, that is you know, more than pay for the price of the car. 
Oh my God. Do you know, just the last meet I went to last weekend, uh, if I ever have in a specific area, if I want, this guy owns all of the property agents in the specific area. That means like, oh my God, if I want to buy a house in that area, I just give him a call say, hey, I want a deal. Next deal comes along, give it to me. <laughs> you see, the, I mean, not quite like that, but well, I mean, that's, it's, that's it's almost that's like that. that. You, know, you met that person, you have that person on your roll decks. And to me, proximity is always power. Mm. Surrounding yourself with, with other people you know, that, are, uh, that can help you in business and help you in life. It's all, it's all about it. It's so funny you say that, John, because I was just thinking about it. I'm like, how dumb of me not to go to these events all this long? Because they were, kept asking me, come to the event, come to the event. And the one time that I went, I'm like, this is what I've been missing. This is so cool. Yeah, and I'll tell you, you know, one of the guys, he owns like a vodka brand and another one owns like a coffee brand. And then and they said, oh, what's your social media? And they went and followed me on social media. Oh my God, you got so many followers. Like, can I pay you money to make a post? I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I wouldn't advertise alcohol because I don't drink alcohol, but like, you know, but I'm talking about those types of brand deals are, 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 are there, you know, like clothing brands. Okay, if you got a hoodie and you do like, you know, I, I you know, just like you, I work out, I'm not as in a great shape as you are, but um, you know, I do work out and, you know, like vegan stuff. I'm plant-based now. So I, any, any vegan brand deals, I mean, there's so much business that comes from it. It's like, kind of like, it's indirect that comes to you. I saw your post, man. I saw your post. You're going out for a run and it's already cold in the UK. Oh, yeah. It's like. I saw the post, man. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you know, thank God, man. You know, uh, I, I live in Southern California and it's like 80 degrees, 85 degrees all the time. <sighs> But I, you know, I've been to UK when I was young. I love the UK. You know, uh, you know, I, I do. I love, I love visiting the UK. I, you know, you know, and uh, I can't wait to get back. Now, John, for for young entrepreneurs who are starting out right now, you know, you're a young, you know, you are, uh, you know, you're a young aspiring entrepreneur. One, you know, at one time in your life, somebody who's starting right now. What would, what would be your advice for them to take it to the next level? Honestly, the easiest way is just find, get into a network, right? That, you know, you, you say proximity is power, but I, environment is, is it, it, it will always get you, always. So like, if I could start all over again, I would, and I would do exactly what I would do. Find, either buy your way into a network or friend your way into a network or find some value proposition that gets you into that network um, by adding some kind of value. You know, find someone you can learn from. It's the fastest way. I mean, I don't know why people try and want to figure stuff out by themselves. It doesn't make sense. It costs you money. It costs you time. Like, you know, for the sake of a couple of thousand dollars, just pay someone. That's why all these companies that are billion dollar companies, do you think they have, you know, free stuff? No, they pay for the best people in the world to give them advice on what to do next. That's it. That's, 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 that's my only advice to everyone watching right now. Pay someone money to give you advice. Because, and then people who are trying to don't have the money, sacrifice something, right? Why? Because if you sacrifice something, you you're going to do it. You sold your car. You sold your car so, so you can get mentorship and, you know, so you sold your car to be around the right people. Not many people are, are, are willing to do that, you know, they're, they're, because they're willing to, they, they think the car is more valuable than information. You know, I don't know if you heard of this, um, this saying, this, this little story, you know, and, and matter of fact, I, I have a story to tell you and it just makes total sense, you know, you know, you know, paying somebody for, to, to help you take to the next level. Actually, I got a couple of stories, but, but you know, when I bought this house, you know, um, the elevator, the light in the elevator didn't work, you know, and it just, it was a brand new home, but the elevator light, the light in the elevator didn't work. And I was so pissed off. I'm like, all right. So I, I called my general contractor. He, he come try it for two or three days. He couldn't fix it. I called my electrician. The electrician come in for two days, looking at it, he couldn't fix it. I call my handyman. The handyman comes in, couldn't fix it. And I'm like, what is going on? It's just a light bulb, right? It's just a light bulb. How hard can that possibly be? You know? So I call an elevator company. And the elevator company says, look, if we come over there, if we were to come over there, you know, we're gonna, we have to maintain, you know, main, do a maintenance on the elevator. I'm like, it's a new home. That is a new maintenance. He goes, but well, we need to do maintenance anyway. So it's going to cost you $1,100 for us to come over, but we'll take a look at it and all that kind of stuff. John, they came in within, within four, 20, 30 minutes, they fixed the light. 
you know, so the reason for that story is that, you know, the experts can solve your problem in record time. You know what I mean? You know, so if you have an issue, you, you, you want to learn something, you know, pay an expert to teach you how to do it in a record time. You don't want to waste time and energy and, and go in and, and try to figure out, you know, like you say yourself. So, um, you know, and, and, and some of the best things that I've done, you need one person or one piece of knowledge to make your next million bucks. Don't you agree? That's the thing. It's all ideas, ideas, execution, but it's opening your mind. It's like sometimes people already know it. It's just never been synthesized in a way that they can understand. Like they know the idea, they know what to do, but it's sat there in their mind. Like, it's like my, one of my best friends, David, he said, you know, like one day his, his, his wife's car broke down and he, the wife called him and he went all the way down there to jack up the car and it was raining and he was really pissed off. And he's like, okay. And he said to himself, you know, if, if there was only just one thing you could put under your car, press a button and the car would lift up. Guess what? 10 years later, we go shopping. He sees this, this, this automatic jack that jacks your car up when pressing a button. He says, oh my God, that's my idea. I said, yeah, it's your idea, but you didn't execute on it. So you know? So yeah. it's, it's, it, you, that's why you need to have a coach. Ideas are 10 a penny. you got the mentors and coaches force you to implement. The money that you invest in this is is that's that that's your uh, pain money that's your pain money if you don't do it there's pain a lot of people they do it they want things for free people don't value things for free nothing you know gives you a better return on investment than investing in yourself and your knowledge and you are a true testament to what you just preached because the way you made your wealth is by getting around the right people you know by getting around vincent by going to the investor, by going to, you know, that, that first pitch that you did and you were all scared and, you know, you don't know, you know, what, you know what to say. So, you know, you are a true testament to what you preach. John, for people who want to pick up your book, you know, want, want to know more about you and everything that you offer. I know you also have real estate courses, don't you? Yeah, we run programs in real estate, business, investing, social media. Uh, yeah, we run a lot, of, a lot of different programs. So can you tell them where they can find more about you when it can where they can get all, you know, all your information. Yeah, just any social media, just go to YouTube. If you want to learn about marketing, for example, because one of the biggest things you need to learn, just type in social media marketing, John Lee on YouTube. You see, I've got hundreds of videos. It's all free, you know, and we teach some really good content in there and some concepts. Hey, some things like that. Free. You know, you know that, that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, you know, you wanted to, you know, learn stuff. Just go Google it. Just, just go. There are so much information out there. So there's no excuses these days. Right, right, exactly. Um, if they want to buy my book, just um, I, my, my newest book is the blue one, actually. You know what, Sam, I'll send you a copy of that. Just, if you send my address later, I'll send you a copy of that. But that's called Business Hat. That, that book's actually being endorsed by the co author of Rich Dad Poor Dad. No. So it's full circle now. What is it called? Business Hack. Business Hack, okay. Yeah, yeah. and if, if people don't like reading like me, uh, you can get the audible version. So it's there as well. So yeah, it just gives you a lot of concepts on that. A lot of concepts. But yeah, if you just, just type in John Lee into like, um, uh, you know, YouTube or Google or uh, Instagram, you'll see them, my account's got the verified account on, um, um, you know, Instagram. So you can, you know, I've got a lot of content. It's all free. You don't have to pay for it. It's all, it's all free on there. So yeah, you know, it's, and it's and, you know, one thing I said to myself is, why aren't, why isn't this knowledge available everywhere? I mean, I paid a lot of money to learn this stuff and I'm not, it's part of my way of giving back, you know, to the next generation so they can learn this stuff. So they don't have to go through all the pain, blood, sweat, and tears that I had to go through. So yeah, come check that stuff out. John, we really appreciate you, you know, telling us your story, drop some knowledge bomb on us and giving all this free information out to the world, just on your, you know, your way of giving back to everyone. You know, I really appreciate your time and we look forward to having you back on the podcast. Awesome, Sam. And also keep up the amazing work. I think, you know, with what you're doing, you know, touching many lives, giving them the opportunities that we never had. I think that's amazing and that's very inspirational. So thank you for serving the community. Thanks, John. God bless. Hey guys, if you liked today's episode, do me a huge favor. Go ahead and leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel, leave me a review and tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we share today. Really appreciate it. God bless.